Hello everyone, my name is Marianna Antenucci and today I will have the pleasure to bring the followers of Derek to the Yale School of Management in Connecticut where we will talk about the Volkswagen emission scandal. I'm here with Professor David Back who is a Senior Associate Dean for the Executive MBA at Yale, Senior Lecturer of mm -hmm. uh, Global Business and Politics, and who also wrote a really interesting article about this case, uh, published on the Financial Times just some days after the scandal broke. Sure. So, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Buck, for this opportunity. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. Let me just do a really short recap of this case. Sure. So in mid-September, the Environmental Protection Agency discovered that uh, many VW cars being sold in America had a defeat software which mm -hmm. was used to cheat uh, emission tests in the US. Uh, Volkswagen has admitted that uh, around uh, 11 million cars worldwide uh, um, were fitted and are fitted with this um, defeat device yes. and 8.5 million cars are in Europe and just 500,000 are in the US yes. and the damage on the environment and also on human health is huge since those cars um, have emitted around 40 times allowable emission of nitrogen oxidized which yes. is particularly harmful yeah. for people and now Volkswagen could, uh, um, could be fined by the EPA for around $18 billion. So this is one of the biggest corporate scandal and uh, environmental fraud of recent years. Yes. Actually. So I would like to start with a quite general question. So in your opinion, why the market for diesel car in the US is so small compared to the market in Europe? I mean, in Europe, <laughs> there are around 50% of cars are diesel cars, while in the US, just 1% are yes. diesel cars. So in your opinion, what are the reasons of this huge difference and uh, are there also reasons related to environmental policy? Sure. No, I, you're absolutely correct. I mean, there are big differences between the market in the U.S. and the market in Europe. And you're quite right that a lot of it has to do with environmental policy or with, more generally, government regulation. Um, so in Europe, um, a, a number of years ago, many years ago, 20 years ago, um, the emphasis w was really on improving fuel efficiency of cars, and diesel technology uh, can deliver what here in the U.S. you would call greater gas mileage, basically more efficiency. Uh, and so, you know, the tax system uh, in particular um, provided incentives for uh, purchasers to buy diesel cars. You know, diesel fuel uh, was cheaper. Um, there are other tax benefits often for people buying diesel cars, and particularly a lot of commercial users um, who have lots of you know, fleets of small cars started purchasing a lot of diesel cars, and that really made them attractive to mainstream uh, users, in particular ones turbo diesels got introduced and you know, they delivered a lot of performance, um, and uh, they weren't you know, you know, your grandfather's diesel car anymore, if you will. Um, here in the U.S., government policy was different. Uh, diesel fuel was mainly for trucks and for trains. Um, in Europe, we rely a lot more on the railroads, and so there's a lot more diesel fuel available. That may have played a role as well. In any case, here in the U.S., the market for passenger diesel cars never really developed. It, it did sort of in the early 1980s, but back then diesel cars were loud and you know didn't start very easily, and they produced a lot of... Um, emissions and so regulations here in the US got tightened around diesel and tax benefits didn't materialize the same way as they did in Europe and so for the longest time you know it was very very difficult even to find a gas station a petrol station where you could buy diesel fuel uh, it had started to change over the last few years and the company most responsible for trying to reintroduce America if you will to passenger diesel cars was really Volkswagen you know that was part of their strategy they wanted to become the largest car company in the US sorry the largest car company in the world and in order to do that they had to make inroads in the US and they decided to do it with 
their most uh, successful uh, set of products. And those were turbo diesels, uh, fairly affordable, fuel efficient, uh, with a lot of performance. And so they launched a very ambitious campaign here in the U.S., a lot of marketing, uh, trying to get Americans to sort of embrace diesel and follow the Europeans in, in that lead, which makes this scandal uh, and the fact that they were cheating standards here so particularly egregious because the whole point uh, of what they were trying to do was to try to get Americans to accept diesel cars the same way that the Europeans had. Do you think that they were succeeding in, the, I don't know, convincing America that the diesel were good, were environment? So yeah, I think so. I mean, I you know, if if you look at the sales data, they were certainly quite good. You know, people were buying diesel cars here who had never bought a diesel car before. Uh, it wasn't just Volkswagen; it was the entire group. So it was Audi, uh, it was Porsche, uh, even. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the numbers were still quite small. You're absolutely correct. There's only 500,000 cars here in the U.S. versus 11 million worldwide. Uh, but, you know, growth rates had been quite good for Volkswagen here with their diesel model. So, so yes, they, um, they were gaining traction. And, and uh, you know, other manufacturers were watching this and were preparing to follow suit in part because here in the U.S., there's now more pressure also to increase fuel efficiency of, of cars and of fleets. And of course, diesel seems to deliver that. And so it was a very attractive choice for a lot of consumers and a lot of uh, manufacturers. And um, coming back to the environmental policy that uh, yeah. influences this trend, do you think that uh, in Europe uh, yeah. there was a strong maybe lobby <clears throat> of uh, <clears throat> giant car manufacturing to this transition? Maybe they were already ready to lead this transition from uh, petroleum to diesel yeah. and so after the Kyoto Protocol when uh, the EU set this um, strong target of reduction of CO2 that uh, could be reached thanks to diesel car because yes. they have a low CO2 emission maybe I'm thinking that uh, Probably car manufacturers try to boost <laughs> the the boost it is uh, yeah. this transition because yes. maybe they were already ready to death and maybe in the U.S. Uh, was different uh, and uh, so they they succeed in uh, this because uh, they still receive many incentive uh, from the U.S. Uh, from uh, the European Union and uh, from European countries sure. uh, so discount uh, subsidy direct subsidies. Yeah. So maybe there, Europe, there was a good lobbying activity yeah. of a giant car manufacturer that yeah. were ready to yeah. this transition. Do you think that? No, I think that's possible? absolutely correct. I mean, if 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 you look at it, the the big environmental issue in Europe that has been shaping um, policy has been climate change and has been. Europe's desire to reduce its CO2 emission, and of course transportation plays a really important role. So the EU has supported everything that seems to reduce emissions, particularly CO2 emissions, I should say. In the US, um, there's been uh, a very different uh, approach. As you know, uh, the US never uh, committed and implemented, uh, committed to and then implemented the Kyoto Protocol until very recently. There were no uh, emissions reductions targets. And so the focus of the EPA, the focus of environmental regulation, was much more on reducing smog. It was much more on the impact of exhausts, of fumes, uh, on the health of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, people in their communities. So whereas in Europe, essentially, you see a reduction of CO2 emissions as, as the main goal, and diesel seem to provide that, uh, albeit often at the cost of slightly higher emissions of uh, nitrogen oxides or of uh, particles, uh, which were tolerated in Europe because the European car manufacturers were contributing to the overarching goal of reducing CO2 emissions. Here in the US, CO2 emissions were less of a priority, but making sure that uh, smog was fought and that um, air pollution, local air pollution was brought down was one of the reasons why standards here in the US when it came to nitrogen oxides and to particles were much, much more stringent in Europe. Um, it so happens that, of course, the regulations in Europe supported the European manufacturers, not just Volkswagen, uh, but also Ford and Opel and uh, Renault, Peugeot, 
uh, fiat, you know, all the others who were investing heavily in diesel technology, whereas here in the U.S., these regulations tended to favor U.S. manufacturers as well as the manufacturers of foreign cars in the U.S. You know, Toyota builds a lot of cars here in the U.S. that focused on cleaner gasoline engines and uh, hybrid technology, particularly these gasoline engines, you know, with more CO2 emissions but fewer emissions of nitrogen oxides and particles. So you see essentially two different ways of prioritizing. You see the industry following the incentives. And then you see Volkswagen trying to bring its strategy that they had successfully developed in Europe to the U.S., realizing that they couldn't comply with the regulations here and using a defeat device to get around it. Yeah, really clear. Let's, let's see if uh, after they COP21, it will be more harmonized because uh, ju just a short comment about uh, the conference of Paris. Sure. I saw President Obama say that told to everyone that it was uh, an historic agreement yes. and that that uh, agreement is about uh, re reducing CO2 emission uh, to avoid uh, the increase in temperature of yeah. uh, 1.5 degrees. Uh, Degree. So yes. let's see if after this conference uh, there will be um, major harmonization uh, yeah. between uh, U.S. and uh, Europe. So. Well, well, let me just point out, if you'll allow me, that you know President Obama de deserves a lot of credit for leading globally on this, given that the Congress in the United States and a large part of the public are opposed to making any commitments to reducing CO2 emissions and addressing climate change. And he did it in part by using executive orders to put emissions limits on um, coal-fired plants, uh, as well as increasing uh, fleet efficiency of cars and other things. But if you look at the rhetoric around the coal-fired plants, the argument he is making is that we need to clean the air for our children to breathe. In other words, here in the American political discourse, an argument about making painful changes right now to save the planet 70, 80, or 100 years into the future is a lot less effective than making an argument that air pollution from power plants or from dirty cars is affecting our children right now. And so even though you have a similar goal, reducing CO2 emissions to prevent temperatures from increasing more than 1.5 degrees, you see different strategies for getting political support. In Europe, very much lofty goals about saving the planet. In the U.S., much more tangible about protecting children, which means that we shouldn't expect the U.S. now to embrace the European approach of relying on diesel technology uh, because at the end of the day, the president has made uh, a commitment or has gotten buy-in for his climate agenda very much by focusing on uh, healthy air right now. And that has some implications for the kind of policies and products that will be supported. Yes, clear. Thank you for this comment. So let's move to um, European Environmental Agency. Sure. Uh, do you think that um, this scandal show that um, they failed? I mean, uh, uh, this scandal broke in the U.S. where the VW cars were considerably fewer than yeah. in Europe. Yes. So do you think that this was a failure of uh, environmental um, agency in Europe and also vehicle certification uh, agency in Europe? and? Also, if uh, this scandal can tell us that uh, probably U.S. agencies are more independent than yeah. uh, EU agencies. Um, great question. Um, clearly, European regulation has failed. Right? I mean, this should have never uh, been allowed to happen. And, and it has raised some important questions about how much in Europe uh, regulators have relied on the goodwill and self-regulation of the industry. So the industry... Uh, developed its own testing protocols that the governments approved, but basically made a commitment to regulate itself. And this is something that, that uh, you know, Europe often employs. There's a lot of self-regulation. The European Union can, sometimes calls it co-regulation with the governments of the EU set a framework, but really industry drives the action. That often is sensible. It makes things um, more flexible. Uh, it often is more cost efficient. You get a lot of buy-in here in the U.S. Regulation is often adversarial. The government puts out rules. The private sector sues. A court has to sort it out. This doesn't tend to happen in Europe. But it does mean that in Europe there is the risk that 
industry players end up cheating or might not implement systems that are really delivering on the public policy goals that have been agreed upon. And in the U.S., that risk is lower because the likelihood of getting caught potentially is higher. At the very least, the consequences of getting caught uh, are higher. I think it's a black eye for Europe that it was a U.S. agency um, that uh, revealed this. Having said that, interestingly, it wasn't the EPA itself who figured this out. You know, it was a nonprofit, and a nonprofit with operations in Europe as well as in the U.S. that got curious about this. And so, at the end of the day, civil society plays a really important role because no government can, you know, watch everybody, and and uh, you know, at least we hope not. And uh, so, it's it's a it's a it's noteworthy that a nonprofit uh, environmental group first caught on to this, but that they went to the EPA to raise alarm about it because they expected the EPA to respond more swiftly because their interest is, is enforcing U.S. Uh, uh, law and ensuring that the air is clean. Whereas in Europe, sometimes you know uh, we think uh, quite a bit also about. Uh, uh, you know, industry and uh, jobs and other things, and so it's it's uh, it's it's telling that it happened in the U.S. and and I think uh, it has already triggered some soul searching in Europe about how regulation has to change. Yeah. And uh, if I can add something, that sure. no profit organization discovered that there was something wrong about yeah. two years ago, yeah. and that they also told to the I don't know which who was sure. responsible at that time of Volkswagen, yeah. but uh, someone of the environmental department uh, people yes. responsible. And they told them that uh, they were uh, that this organization was uh, starting to tell to EPA that Correct. there was uh, something wrong. Yeah. So it's a, um, it's a scandal that broke uh, in these months, but uh, it's oh, something that started. Oh, this has been going on for a long yeah, time. Exactly. And, you know, Volkswagen, I think, really didn't take it very seriously. Yeah. You know, didn't think that uh, uh, it would be... Uh, leading to what you described at the outset, a threat of uh, the possibility of multi-billion dollar sales, Volkswagen, uh, sorry, fines. Volkswagen sales in the U.S. are plummeting. Um, the brand is deeply damaged. I mean, you wonder uh, what people were thinking, not just when they created an environment where such a defeat device could be developed and deployed, but also when they didn't take seriously, um, you know, warnings that this was actually going on. And my last question is about, it's about future. Sure. So, what uh, do you, how do you think this scandal can affect future evolvement of environmental regulation? What will change uh, because of this scandal? So, I, I, as far as environmental regulation is concerned, I think that uh, for the time being, certainly in the automobile sector in Europe, we're going to see more direct government regulation. Um, uh, if you look at uh, the parallel, for example, the Enron scandal here in the U.S. that I've compared this to, um, you got a much stricter regulation of the accounting profession. Right. It used to be that accountants could be accountants and consultants at the same time, and people sort of trusted uh, the private sector to do this well. And after uh, the scandal, um, you see a clear separation between accounting and consulting, a clear regulation of the accounting profession, You know, much more uh, draconian penalties for cheating on uh, financial statements and so on. So I think we'll see some of that uh, as a result of this. We'll see a much more stringent regulation of the um, performance um, evaluation systems. You know, I hope that we'll see swifter uh, and, 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 and firmer penalties against those who cheat. Uh, it's still not obvious that there will be any kind of criminal penalties in Europe. Certainly in the U.S. there is the possibility of, of criminal penalties. Um, my biggest concern is um, what this might do to the role of business in dealing with environmental challenges. Um, because um, even though um, you know, Volkswagen in this case you know, cheated, um, the only way we're going to implement uh, 
for example, uh, the goals of the Paris, uh, the COP21 agreement that you just mentioned, is through private sector leadership. The private sector has to develop the technologies, bring down the costs, scale them up to get us to a place where we can, you know, live our lives, uh, you know, the way, the way we all hope to live them without destroying our planet at the same time. Um, and so private sector leadership is essential. Technology and innovation are essential. Uh, and one of the things that I fear is that the next time a company comes around and say, look, we took an existing technology and made it cleaner and cheaper and better, people are going to say, oh, this is just like okay. Volkswagen. You know, I'm sure they have a defeat device in there somewhere that is cheating. And, and I hope that that won't happen. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge risk, I yeah, think. Yeah. Just a final, really, a final question. And in, in, the, in the European Union, yeah. do you think that uh, stricter regulation would also mean uh, centralized? So, I mean, uh, um, one of the big problems sure. of uh, the European Union in this case is that uh, sometimes national authority, national uh, regulation says, okay, those cars were certified sure. by the authority. Sure. In Italy, they say by the authority, by the German authority. In yes. Germany, they can yeah, say yeah, by yeah, the yeah, other yeah. authority. So, at the end of the day, no, no authority find itself uh, guilty about yeah. this scandal. Yeah. So, do you think that the direction it's difficult but do you think that a direction could be a central yeah, authority yeah, to yeah. verify because I, I, I think that uh, there are um, many challenges right. that uh, we have to reach uh, the target that uh, were just uh, declared uh, in uh, Paris right. but actually um, controlling some standard design emission like uh, emission from cars should yeah. be easy yeah should yeah. be quite yeah. easy of course there is a fraud there was a, a, a nivel sure. <laughs> defeat device in this case but yeah. should be easy so do you think that this stricter regulation could lead in europe to centralization it's possible you know so so i don't think centralization is necessarily a solution um but let me answer the question by saying that what would be necessary to bring about centralization is going to help us solve the problem. So what, what do I mean by that? In a lot of areas um, of European regulation, you think about food safety, pharmaceuticals, uh, financial markets, data privacy, what we have is a hybrid model. We have regulatory agencies at the member state level that are pretty closely coordinated, often by an EU agency or by a network uh, of agencies, sometimes anchored on the commission, sometimes not. So, so greater coordination is certainly a good thing to make it impossible that somebody says, I got it approved here, even though you didn't get it approved there, and so on. But I think the bigger issue is that when we look at environmental regulation in Europe, too often member states are still looking at it from the perspective of national interests. Let me just give you a quick example, right? When the EU proposed new regulations to limit CO2 emissions of cars, the German government in particular lobbied pretty heavily and said, well, look, this is unfair, these rules, because the French cars and the Italian cars are much smaller and much lighter than ours, so clearly they have lower CO2 emissions. Okay? The perspective of the planet, of the environment, would be to say, precisely, and so German manufacturers should also be making small, light, fuel-efficient cars like the French and like the Italians, right? But the sort of national interest um, uh, perspective is to say, no, we want to develop our own cars, um, you know, according to our own standards. Uh, and so what the Germans did is they actually ensured the European regulations um, took into account the weight of the car. Okay? And that just sort of completely defeats the purpose because the planet doesn't care if it gets uh, worsened by a very fuel-efficient big car. Okay? Uh, we need to reduce you know, overall emissions. Um, in other words, you know, what needs to happen is that European governments realize that the goal of achieving a um, you know, more sustainable climate at some point will come into conflict with national policy, with national interests, and with industrial policy. And at the end of the day, they have to decide what is more important. I think we're still not at a point in Europe where we say, you know what, we're going to change our industry. We're going to encourage our companies to move in a different direction to bring this about. In other words, centralization itself isn't really the solution unless you have a consensus that overarching environmental goals really should be 
uh, you know, sacrosanct and, and, and should really be shaping the industry. Once that happens, you can achieve it through centralized or decentralized regulation. But the important thing is to say this overarching goal is more important than our immediate concerns for the sales of this particular model or the number of jobs in this particular factory. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. You're very Professor welcome. Beck. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And um, un saluto a da Yale a tutti gli ascoltatori di Derrick. Thank Bye. you. Grazie Bye. mille.